I knew that the number one problem facing humanity was unresolved trauma. Drugs and alcohol, violence, workaholism, those are all symptoms of unresolved trauma. Today we're talking about how to overcome a disaster with the author of Post Traumatic Thriving, Dr. Randall Bell. Welcome to the podcast, sir. Well, thank you, Jax, and thank you, Martin. It's, it's really exciting to be with you, uh, with, with you guys. Totally, man. Um, we're excited to get stuck in, as, as we were saying. It's an absolutely unprecedented time, and I'm sure you see this a lot out there in the, in the news cycle, articles flying about, uh, you know, how, to, how your life changes after the pandemic and what to do. I know myself, I'm feeling socially awkward nowadays. I don't even know how to behave. Come on. I am, man. Trust me. But just by way of kicking things off, Dr. Randall, who's the book for? And why is it important? Well, the book, I hate to say this, but it's for everyone. Uh, the, the statistics are that by college age, uh, 66 to 85 percent of us have been hit by a trauma. And when you get to be my age, it's it's 100 <laughs> percent. You know, we we've all been smacked down by this by this thing we call trauma. So it's uh, it's for all of us because. These skills of healing from trauma, they're not taught to us in school, at least uh, my school system. I don't know about yours in the UK, but uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. What, what would you describe as a trauma for you? Because like, that could mean different things to different people, right? We're talking about hurricanes. When you say trauma, I think of like tsunamis hurricane like things yeah. like that that's what sprung to mind the, and stuff. The, the, i mean the result well, mean the like, result is the result could be a trauma but they're really disasters they're disasters right? but i guess for p different people has different yeah, definitions different mental trauma. yeah yeah that's a fair comment martin you know my my business uh, my profession is stealing uh, or studying disasters and uh it could be hurricanes or tornadoes or crime or any number of mm -hmm. things but the the thing is is that something can happen to you and not bother you, it could happen to me and it could be a trauma. It's, it's you know, it differs for everyone. It could be a divorce. It could be a death. It could be a disease, a disaster. They all seem to start with a, the letter D, but whatever it is, if we have a hard time, meaning it takes two or three months to kind of get over it and process it, we're traumatized at that point. I think that's the tricky thing about certain traumas is they're not as tangible, uh, especially emotional trauma. Would you? Does your book help with things like that as well? It, it really does, because the good news is that even though there are literally dozens, if not hundreds of things that can traumatize us, the the great news is that the the process of healing from trauma, which is a scientific issue, it's been really studied well by scientists all around all around the world, uh, is the same. Whether it's COVID or, you know, in my case, I was born with a congenital heart defect. And I had open heart surgery when I was a little kid. So that was Crazy. traumatic. It doesn't matter. The, the process of healing from a trauma is the same for all of us, wherever we are around the world. And was that your, the trauma you experienced as a kid, your reason for writing this book? That, that it's so interesting you ask that, Jax, because it wasn't. I didn't even think about it because I made the classic mistake of stuffing those feelings down, not talking about it, being embarrassed about it. I hated, you know, when it came up with my family, I, I wanted to shut that conversation down as fast as I could, which is exactly the wrong way to do things. But as I wrote the book, I had to change my tone from kind of this preachy, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, to we need to do this, we need to do that, because I realized that, hey, I was traumatized by my stuff too. Right. I'm, not a, I'm not any different than anyone else. <laughs> So what is it you want the reader to take away, given this is a very big area and can be categorized in a number of different ways? Well, Martin, I, it, I, I worked on the book for 10 years and it, it evolved because I wasn't sh I knew I, I came up with the title. I knew it was a big problem. I knew that the number one problem facing humanity was unresolved trauma. Drugs and alcohol, violence, workaholism, those are all symptoms of unresolved trauma. I knew all that. I started with that premise. And what I kind of evolved through was the first five chapters are on the the five levels of grief, you know, that have been well explored for years, you know, in terms of shock, denial, anger, depression, those those things. And then there's some great research out of the University of North Carolina on post-traumatic growth. And, you know, in terms of people who have grow, grown as a result of tapping into their energy of the trauma, what I needed to do as it evolved was Bridget. So I divided the book into three stages, ultimately dive, survive, and thrive. 
Dive is where you get knocked down. It's where you get punched in the face, you know, and you fall down. Survive is when you get back on your feet and dust yourself off and reclaim your life. But what I noticed uh, in my career with, with studying disasters all over the place is that there's a certain segment that really tap into that energy, and it's as if they're woken up and they thrive. They do amazing things. And I was fascinated by that because, you know, whatever they were putting into their cornflakes, I, I wanted the same thing for me. I wanted to understand what they were doing. So that's how it evolved. Dive, survive, and thrive, and then really getting into the literature. And then to round it out, I, I have about a dozen people in the book. I studied their lives and their application of these principles and people that are really doing amazing things today um, and, and integrated that with the science. Can I ask a quick question about how much you measured um, the, the categorization? Because it feels like it's not a box. It feels like it's a pyramid. And, and Jax will tell you I love a pyramid. He loves pyramids. I love just, pyramid. Oh, he's always going on about it. <laughs> and, and let me describe what I mean. You d dive, you know, dive, survive, and thrive. I want to like it, by the way. It's very catchy. But, but I wonder if... He's got it's, a knack for titles, isn't he? he you, yeah. Yeah, you really do. Three, three word titles to be precise. You need precise, to get him right? in for copywriting. As I do, well, I yeah. do. Um, when I think of that foundation, dive, it feels like that's the fattest part, the widest part of the pyramid, and that less people will survive uh, in terms of complete recovery. And if that's a sub to optimal state, you can thrive, right? So, so most people do not, um, certainly in my 20 years of teaching entrepreneurship, not everyone's going to thrive. Not everyone's going to build a successful business. I think even before you business. get to thrive, you'll survive, right? Well, well, and, and there's different levels of survival, which is my only curiosity is whether it's really a, a true, pro, you know, whether your measurement of this is that you take account of everyone in scope, but actually it's a bit Darwinian, right? It's survival of the fittest and that it's a level of maturity that they're going through. But yet you make the case that many can survive in terms of not carrying... Because my view is, if I carry trauma for 10 years, mm. am I still diving, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if I conclude something and I can say I've survived, perhaps I now have a, a replenished platform to go and thrive. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit to, you know, is this an all-in or is it more of a pyramid structure in terms of how people, the, the, the sample selection evolves? You're right. It is that, you know, obviously people get knocked down, you know, every day left and right. And that's, a, that's the wide base of the pyramid. And... And relatively speaking, fewer, you know, survive and fewer thrive. The the good news is, though, that we can we can shake that model off. The more we get this information into the hands of people that realize, hey, everybody can thrive. I know that may sound a little cliche, but right. the science is there. The information is there. The idea is we're all going to go through our traumas. If we go through these processes in an intelligent way, we can all ultimately thrive. There's nothing really unique in terms of IQ or wealth or privilege or socioeconomic class about the thrivers. It's just people that made this conscientious decision to tap into that energy because when you get knocked down, you know, the adrenaline's going, you're charged, you know, you're ready to go. And if you tap into that uh, energy appropriately, you can thrive. If you tap into it inappropriately, you're going to self-medicate and do all kinds of, you know, um, you know, not so great stuff. So, that's the good news. Everybody can do it if they make that choice and if they have the information. Yeah, that's the bit I was going to say is for them to arrive at reading your book, they sounds like they have to be at the next stage where they're not diving as much anymore, basically. Yeah, where well, you're just saying I've had enough of this. I, I this is not working, and I need uh, you know I need to try something new because the what I'm doing I'm just getting more miserable. We we don't want that. We want people to get back on their feet and have healthy lives. Does your ability to thrive, does that get lessened the more time you spend in the dive part of the pyramid? What is a good amount of time to spend diving and is is there too much time where it's too far? Do you know what I mean? That energy has gone. Yeah, I, the, the scientists that have studied that exact question generally say that two or three months of of being of mourning and grief and you know you lose a loved one you go through a divorce you go you know something a, a good friend passes away or, or or that two or three months is is normal there's nothing wrong with anger there's nothing wrong with depression they're they're necessary steps on the path the idea is if we get stuck there for more than two or three months 
uh, we need to we need to up our game. We need to do something and and really accept the help of professionals that that know how to handle this. Yeah, two to three months. For well, sure, I, mate. I, yeah. I would I would venture that it's a thin slither, which let's argue X is 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 three months, but actually the the survive part is is four six five sevenths of the pyramid because it's at varying stages, and I imagine that that survival period is another minimum three, six months to several years. And then you've got just a tip, which you can add as whatever percentage you want, of people that are out of survival. They've gone through, they're, they're, you know, not everything's perfect, but they're surviving and they go on to, to, to thrive. Would that characterize your sample set generally? Or am I, have I got that wrong? No, I think that's that's pretty fair. Uh, the the dive stage. When I say you know, I mean, when you lose a parent, you lose a loved one, you're gonna be sad about it for a long time. When I say two or three months, and I think when the when the academics are studying it, they're talking about that. Just you're 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 so knocked down, you just can't function. Got you me. know, that's two or three months. But if there's gradual progression, that's that's what we're looking for is oh. gradual progression through that. We don't get stuck in that, you know, uh, in, incapacitated, uh, you know, downer stage uh, for more than two or three months. But yeah, the, the survive stage, um, you know, I, I that's a, again, you guys are bringing up some fascinating questions that that uh, we really need need to address in terms of the, the, the time frame. But yeah, a few months there, and ultimately, you know, you wa wander into the thrive stage. That's where we want to ultimately end up. Sure, sure. Okay, cool. So let's get a sense of the kind of work you do because you're an economist, right? And uh, right. So you worked on a Sandy Hook school shooting in 2012, for example. So, firstly, are there some cases that you've worked on that people who are listening would be familiar with? And then, what was your role? in those cases since the 1980s so maybe before you guys were born i've been i've been working on these disasters i worked on the world trade center i worked on flight 93 i worked on the bikini toll nuclear weapons test sites i worked on oj and john benet i don't know if you guys heard about those cases over there sure. but uh oh, yeah. crime scenes um hurricane katrina uh heaven's gate wow. you know the mass suicide cult uh, so I've been working on literally hundreds of cases for decades. And Sandy Hook was certainly one of the very most profoundly sad cases I'd ever seen. Just quickly tell us what is you know, summarize what you what you do when you work on a case. Oh, sure. Well, what what happens with a disaster? There are emotional issues and we all kind of get that. But there's also practical issues. And one of the issues is. The, the legal term is diminution in real estate or property values. In other words, if your house is flooded in Hurricane Katrina or if there's a crime scene and you have crime scene stigma, there can be a loss to the property value. So when somebody shows up on TV and says, well, this disaster costs $123 million, I'm, I'm the guy that calculates that number. But that, even though it's economics, uh, you get to know the people behind the statistics, which frankly I find far more interesting than the than the numbers. And I've gotten to know them and and following their stories, and and really that's my passion is is the people behind the numbers. So, but that's what so I do. I'm picturing you're sitting down with the survivors of these disasters and just catching up, and then that's fueled. You, I guess you, I seen it through their eyes, and that's fueled this desire. Yeah, there, there's a lot of haunting moments over my career. I was coincidentally, I was given a speech in New York the weekend of 9/11, and so after I gave my lecture, I, I took the subway down to you know uh, Ground Zero. I had no idea I'd be retained in the case later on, um, but you know when when people walk up to you with a flyer saying, "Have you seen my dad?" Yeah. Uh, or "Have you seen my mom?" That hits you. I mean, I, I'm a parent and. You know, you know, even though I calculate the numbers, being you can't be human and not have that really affect you. And that's what really got me thinking um, about the people more and and what the processes are. And I thought, you know what? You know, I'm 62 years old now. I, I'm getting close to retirement age and I'm, you know, I'm a lousy golfer. And I thought, you know, in retirement, I've had this unique access to these cases and I've sat at kitchen tables and on logs and on curbsides with people that have really been through some amazing difficulties. 
And it would be, I, I feel like I have a responsibility to really document those stories and share them to the extent that they can help others when they get knocked down to have a little bit of a North Star to, to help guide getting through this tough stuff because it affects us all. I think, that's a, I think that's a great way to summarize it. And I like to extend the, the, the common definition of humanitarian. And, and I think of, you know, we can all be humanitarians when we think about how we can help people, where it's contextually, where it's sitting down with them. Uh, it doesn't take the traditional forms of, 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 of philanthropy. And so this is your gig, right? This is your thing. This is what you can offer back to people. Yeah. And I think it's extremely, um, extremely valuable. And I, I, I do also uh, remember 9-11 vividly because I was working in Wall Street and was actually there at the foot of the buildings when they, when they fell down. And it was oh, wow. an incredibly... I didn't uh, know that. Oh yeah, wow. I saw people fall out of the building. It was the most. I had six months nightmare. It was a very uh, tra delayed, traumatic episode, and being locked in the building mm. when the first building came down, and not knowing what Wild. fighter jets were before yeah. you rationalised that that was U.S. airspace being yeah, occupied yeah. And, and stuff. It was a, it was a, a deeply uh, soul searching uh, uh, period. But when I went back to my apartment, I remember uh, watching all the news, and it's still not sinking in that. Uh, everyone except two people had lost their, their life at Cantor Fitzgerald at the top of the building. And I thought, Jesus Christ. And then yesterday I read, you know, reading, and I thought, hey, you know, 2,461 U.S. Uh, troops lost their life during 20 years in Afghanistan. And that's tragic. Hmm. But can you imagine that over 3,000 people lost their life in 9-11 yeah. in one day? Yeah. It's astounding, right? Absolutely hmm. astounding when you think of the scale. Yeah, it's of wild. What, of what went on. You know? Yeah, it's wild. Um, and, and that, by the way, is a great example of hidden trauma mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on, a, <laughs> on a variety of levels. And then there's society, yeah. right? And there's cultural trauma. And then there's the friction of trauma that happens in the system itself. Remember, no one wanted to work downtown. In fact, the CEO came back and shook our hands to get back to work mm. and said, I'll be down here if everyone else de you know, decides to come back to work. And you couldn't, you couldn't sell or buy anything. No one wanted to do anything downtown when that happened. It just killed, um, you know, this thriving city and the, or the you know, the bomb yeah. shell shock for, for years. Um, I guess it's a case in, it's a great case study to talk about how you can help people through it. Yeah, it, 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 9 11 was a biggie. And I, I got called actually five years after 9 11. It, there's a process, and it took five years to get to the economic type of work that I do. But even when I started working on it, that residual, I don't know the right word, uh, depression or, you know, that cloud, whatever you want to call it, it was still there. It was absolutely profound. It's hard to put words to. And and please, I hope nobody misunderstands. Two or three months is, is kind of a typical thing, but something like of that magnitude, you know, let's not, let's be kind to ourselves and give us ourselves more time sure. if we need it, yeah. uh, particularly with something like that. I think an important distinction to make is that you're not forgetting your trauma. You're not, uh, it doesn't disappear. It just, you grow and have a good life with the trauma as part of your life rather than uh, it destabilizing everything. That was the impression I got. Yeah, absolutely. One of the myths, I think it's in chapter 13 on forgiveness, is dispelling the myth that we forgive and forget. I mean, how are you going to forget Sandy Hook? Eh? How are you going to forget yeah, sure. the World Trade Center? You don't forget this stuff. That's right. nonsense. What you do, what the goal is, is to allow the memory to go through our minds harmlessly without being re-triggered and have those mm -hmm. cold flashes and that anger come back where we lose our temper or, you know, you know, lose control. That's the goal. But we don't forget it. That's absurd. So the point I'd make is um, people have got to deal with trauma. It sits in their mind. They're not dealing with dementia. So they're going to live with it. And that's that's the pain. Um it, uh, what do you do to live with those feelings? Is it a reframing of the mind? And, and that's where I think it's lofty, a bit wish-washy, and how do you really come to terms with that? But is, how, what is your method in terms of coping with the trauma itself? The, the methodology, as you, as you called it, um, is basically to work through the processes. There's 15 chapters in the book, five for dive, five for survive, five for thrive. And I caution people, you know, if you're like me, I'm curious. I, I'm the guy that you know, peeks at their Christmas presents and wants to get the, you know, get to the end of this thing, you know, but 
with with trauma recovery, you got to go through each process. You got to feel the shock. You got to feel the denial, the anger, the depression. So you read each chapter in order and kind of process it because that's what real healing is about. It's not about slapping on a Band-Aid and saying, no, oh, whoops, I forgot antiseptic. You know, you got to open the wound. You got to do all the ugly stuff and get the dirt out and properly stitch it so it heals for real, rather than just being uh, aggravated and coming back as something even worse and infected. So that's the goal, um, is to take it one chapter at a time and with a therapist or a trusted friend talking about it, because the, the dynamic duo, there's about eight processes, but the two that I really love talking about, one is called sitting in the fire. That's where you find a great therapist or a good friend or a trauma coach, somebody, frankly, I'm not qualified in that field and I don't pretend to be, but I do recommend people find someone they can trust to talk about it because trauma recovery is not a solo exercise. You can't do sure. it by yourself yep. and people are, get pride and they don't, they don't want to accept help. You got to get over that and accept some help. So sit in the fire with someone that will listen to you. The second thing we call it in San Quentin prison, we call it grounding. Other people call it meditation, Lamaze, um, deep breathing exercises. I don't care what you call it. But the science out of Harvard University is profound that simply deep breathing resets the brain. I, we can get in the physiology and I have diagrams of the brain in the book to explain it all. But a lot of people say, oh, that's too simple. That's not going to work. The fact is the brain scans coming out of Harvard University prove scientifically that deep breathing exercises really work. So I introduce a number of things we can actually do on a practical basis to get us, you know, constantly moving a little bit forward. Now, it's rinse and repeat. Sometimes we get to stage seven and then we go back to being angry. Totally normal. Mm. Totally great. As long as you don't hurt someone and you don't hurt yourself, anger is, is a perfectly healthy emotion. So that's the overall approach I take. Take it a step at a time. Do these practical, simple things. Be kind to yourself. If you go rinse and repeat and land back at shock, I mean, I, you know, World Trade Center is shocking. You know, you revisit that emotion. You can't avoid that. But the general process is forward. And... And then the end result to, to the second part of your question is to allow that memory to go through without being re-triggered. You know, I I buried my my situation with uh, my heart problem where I wouldn't talk about it for decades. Forget two or three months. I was I was a poster boy of bad you know trauma recovery. I lived it for decades. Now, as we talk about it, I'm not triggered. My blood pressure and my pulse. And everything is totally normal because that memory is going, I'm not going to forget I got heart, had heart surgery. I'm talking about it. I'm, that's what we should do. But I'm not being re-triggered. That's what we want is to allow to live life without those re-triggering moments and getting all angry all over again. I'm just looking at this example here, which if we're moving from 9-11, you worked with a woman who hid in a basement for years and then lost her entire family in the Holocaust. I mean, yeah. how do you approach that? <laughs> and what state was she in when you met her? Well, Erica Leon, yeah, she survived the Holocaust. She lost uh, most of her family. She thought she had lost her fiance. It, it was horrific. You know, we we hear about the Holocaust, Holocaust, but she lived it. She lives in Los Angeles. She's 100 years old. Um, she hid in a basement, yeah. It's yeah, crazy. she hid in a basement through the entire war, and she ate uh, potato skins and to survive. Wow. And, um, and but to meet Erica, she's the most cool, you know, friendly, uh, bright. Not in a superficial, sugar-coated way, but in an authentic way. And I I've sat with her for hours and said, Erica, I don't get it. You went through the Holocaust. You lost your family. I'd be raging mad at the Nazis. Mm -hmm. You know. Every minute of my day, if I went through through that, how did you process this? And she explained it, and I explained it in the book in detail. I go through her story in detail. <coughs> Excuse me. And the gist of it is, is that she made a conscientious decision. She appreciates the sunshine, and she appreciates the clouds because the clouds give contrast to make the sunshine even more appreciated. That's something I'm paraphrasing what she told me, but. She would meditate or, or she would just sit quietly and breathe. She would talk about it freely. She did all the things that we're talking about 
And today I have um, oil paintings. She paints beautiful pictures from memory of Budapest where she grew up and went through this. And I say, why are your paintings so colorful and bright and cheerful? And she, and even though you went through this horrific thing in Budapest and it's like, that's my choice. I, I can sit and be depressed all day or I can be alive and, and thankful for what I've got. And that's my choice to do that. Did she ever self-medicate in that process? You know, I I don't honestly recall asking her that. She was, I know she was depressed and how she self-medicated, because that's common, because um, I, I did it myself with workaholism. Um, I, I focus more on her story of once she moved to America and rebuild her life. But next time I see her, all I'm going to ask her that. Yeah, you mentioned workaholism is a big one as well. I mean, how does like something like that kind of trauma compare to something that happens like in an instant? You know, you write about a woman in the book who's been involved in a car accident and then goes on to become addicted to prescription drugs. Um, yeah. You know, how does that compare with someone like Erica? Is it the same process? It is. You're talking about uh, whether the trauma is acute or chronic. In other words, if it hits you out of nowhere or if uh, it's kind of something like me and I was bo I was born with it, it was chronic day to day, you know, kind of issues with my heart. Um, the recovery process is the same. The deep breathing, talking about it, um, experimenting with new hobbies, um, daily quiet time where you have kind of rituals in the morning, whether it's grabbing your tea or your uh, whatever, you know. Uh, Leo Fender, who we might talk about, he's soaked in a in hot water tub for his kind of daily quiet time. These are the kind of techniques. They're simple, but they really work. We got to take them seriously. Yeah, I mean, let's get on to Louis, uh, Leo Fender. So he was your, he was in, he grew up in your town, like next door, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, for the go those of you who don't know, he's the founder of Fender Guitars. And I guess if you're <laughs> going to have a story about thriving, um, that's a great example. Um, tell us about Leo, ma'am. Well, yeah, Leo lives two streets away and I know his family quite well. Mrs. Fender sadly passed away about a year ago. Um, but Leo was born in Fullerton, California, which is where I'm from. And he was born, literally born in a barn. The family hadn't yet built the farmhouse. <laughs> so he's born in a barn. And when he was about eight years old, his trauma was he fell off the, his dad's vegetable truck and the picket fence nailed him in the eye. And oh. so he lost, he had a glass eye uh, and then he had one good eye. And then a little later on, he was, uh, he worked on the, a radio shop on Harbor Boulevard and uh, amplifier speakers blew out his hearing. Um, so he was pretty much deaf without his hearing aids and he, he was half blind. And so that was his start in life. You know, and a lot of people at that point might just say, well, throw in the yeah, towel, screw forget it, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, Leo kept going. And he got this idea uh, at a band, at a uh, World War II band, uh, was playing in the acoustic guitar, so nobody could hear the poor guy. And he thought, well, that guy deserves to be heard like the horns and everyone else and the drums. So he went back to his radio shop and got a piece of wood and bingo, we got the Telecaster and the Stratocaster and this, this enormous legacy. But Leo had his ritual, which I mentioned, of the hot tub. And... Um, and he processed his, his traumas in a really kind of productive way. He was very driven. Uh, the thing that I really admire about Leo Fender, he was not materialistic. Uh, before he moved in our neighborhood, he was living in a, a mobile home, uh, kind of a low, lower income uh, setting. He had, in today's dollars, $300 million put into his bank account. And here's a quiz question for you. Where do you think he moved? Back back to the same place you were born. Uh, he, he didn't move. He, didn't he stayed move. in the mobile home. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so he was in it for the passion. He loved music. He Fair loved enough. that feeling of handing a guitar into a musician's hands. He felt he felt like they were uh, making the world a better place by creating more music. That was his philosophy. He, he could have cared less about the money. Mrs. Fender said all it took to get Leo excited was to tell him we're going to go to Sizzler uh, for for dinner, which is you know not not uh, terribly posh. So. Um, that was Leo Fender. And I'm just, uh, my dad said that it worked when a machine broke down. Leo was the first one to jump on the, you know, jump down on the floor, on the concrete floor and roll under it with a screwdriver and fix it. He was 
Uh, and other people that worked there said, I didn't, I worked there for months before. I thought he was the janitor um, because he wasn't a show off. He was in it for the passion of, of creating more um, instruments and music. Do you find that your research ends up being event driven? So tragedies predominantly, I would mm. imagine, right? Like the, the shootings, which by the way, every time I see one, which when I'm in America, feels like every week. Um, I can't think of anything worse to, to put myself through, just visualizing it, right? And, or I wonder if, if, if there's a common theme of, of trauma. So I would imagine more common day would be financial struggles. And a great example is Leo Fender doesn't care about money. Other people do. Uh, yeah. Keeping up with the yep. Joneses, overspending, divorce. Or perhaps you know, even domestic struggles, you know, like it, growing up in houses yeah. that are oppressive yeah. or cultural yeah. oppressions yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just wonder if there's a popular theme that, that comes out. And uh, you know, what, do, you, do you perhaps not see that sample because, you know, you're focused on broader research and it's event driven? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, yeah, don't get me wrong. Leo started off very poor. Um, he worked 14 hours days. His parents were very uh, militant, um, uh, you know, you know, work, work, work. You're as, only as good as your work. There was no Christmas celebrations, no birthday celebrations. And he was poor for the first part of his life, but he, he just kept going. That's a big part of it. The, the theme are people that keep going, that are resolute, that says, you know what? I'm poor, I'm broke, I've been abused or I've made big mistakes myself in terms of being an abuser, whatever it is. But there's a, there's a mindset of just relentlessly resolute, moving forward gradually. You know, uh, Sir Winston Churchill was a master of that philosophy, and I think that really carries through even to today. Yeah, Martin calls that incremental progress. Mm -hmm. With the Leo example is financially, obviously, smashing it, and he's achieved his... Um, objective of uh, getting more music into the world and more people making music right mm -hmm. but then that's only one half of thriving i would argue the other side of it is emotionally has he been successful and then can you guarantee that as well uh and then the other side of it uh, one more part of that is perhaps leo's raison d'etre for being successful wasn't as linked to his uh trauma you know perhaps it was a lack of, for example, he wanted to, but then you say he's less interested in money. You know, I don't know if it is it as linked to trauma, you know, as perhaps Erica who found solace in painting and living a life. Do you know, do you get what I'm see what I'm trying to get at? Because it's an amazing yeah. case, but I don't know. It's gray, right? Yeah. I, the way I take your question is it kind of, was there, was there a, a, a sense of achievement, a sense of uh, fulfillment at the end of this process rather than just, you know, and and Leo was fulfilled at the end of his life. He, and I know that because he shared that with his wife. Uh, he, he said he had a dream when he was a kid and he was told in this dream by God to his his mission in life was not to be a musician. That's what he wanted to be, but to create instruments. And that's what drove him was that dream throughout his whole life. Um, and at the end of his life, he was fulfilled. He, he relayed that to his wife that I've, I've done what I was put on earth to do. And there was that sense of fulfillment and in comfort and knowing that he had kind of achieved what, what his mission was. Um, and I think that's, that's the truth with all the people I've followed because I've asked him questions along those lines, or in other words, you know, the, the people like the Jeffrey Epstein's of the world kind of drive after materialism and sex, power and money. That's the driving force for some of the world. There's no satisfaction of that. You can buy more islands. You can buy more this, more that. Um, and you're never satisfied. Whereas Leo Fender was more about the complete picture of mind, body and soul. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with sex, power and money. That's all great. But it's it's got to be in context of um, mind, body and soul. That's the fulfillment that I noticed with Erica Leon and with Leo Fender and others, just this, this more fulfillment feeling that they've been more complete in their, in their pursuits. I've also studied this area for a long time, and it's around, around the central idea of a complete purpose. Mm. And one area of complete purpose is a purpose with as minimal or as reduced doubts as possible. And, and I think that's a more better way to, to look because I've read all these different views like you, some religious connotations and practices that talk about mind, body, soul, or, or just looking at achievements or looking at materialism or other, some other binary measurement. And I have no problem with owning an island. 
I don't have to justify it. If I love it, I love it. If I want to stare at art, I'll stare at art. If I want to help people, I'll help people. Do you? But mate? the question is, do I have a complete purpose? And I don't doubt myself. Because if you can live your life, and now I would argue, by the way, to be a good human, that you are going to do that with a sense of empathy, that compassion, sounds very Californian. Love. Um, I don't. Maybe maybe it's American. I don't. But <laughs> my view is, I ha I possess those traits, and 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 I do an awful lot. I, I believe is selfless, but but I wonder if if this is really about um, when people talk about a description or a taxonomy to describe um, a, a, your achievement or a state of progress. I wonder if it really comes back to people just accepting their purpose. Some people it's extremely narrow, and they don't look any further. Some people com compassion or empathy is not not in their skill set right it's not they don't they just yep. don't come and we don't have to look far from politics to see that right the, in, in other areas it's you know people need because they doubt like the, the faith the faith has to come in because they walk around with the doubts when 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 life throws them a curveball whether it's health or whatever and because life's not static and that we will do this all we're trying to do is shave a bit off the peaks and the troughs right just to stay somewhat balanced is that is that a fair? Is that a rational way to look at it? Is to say that uh, that it's about you know that, that you know, you can look at your purpose and if you've achieved it with less doubts. I mean, I've challenged a few people to look at really the same thing, but from a different taxonomy. It's it's more than valid. It's I talk about it in the thrive sections of the book about a purpose about and and preceding the the sense of purpose is experimentation i mean waking up and saying you know what i've always intended to do this or i've always intended to do that one of the stories in the book is a lady who had a life with her husband of luxury she was uh, i met her um when i was on a tv show in uh, hollywood at, on the universal lot and uh, i met her she introduced me to her husband her house was crushed by a landslide and it was a luxury home. I mean, they they had this luxury lifestyle, but they'd always been daydreaming about something different, meaning they wanted a ranch where they outfitted Western movies. That was their purpose, that was their passion. And crushing their life of luxury with a landslide woke them up and now today you go, I've been there, you go to their ranch and they got 20 buildings with saddles and whips and guns and all the things to outfit movies in a really authentic way uh, in, in terms of when somebody watches that movie, they know that that saddle's right for that time period in, in that kind of passionate way. And, um, and that's their thing. And they help people because entertainment gives us a little bit of a, you know, a break from harsh life and that's their thing. So finding that purpose in, and, and realizing, hey, maybe this disaster in my life is going to wake me up to do what I'm really uh, made to do, like it did with Leo. You know, he was made to make guitars, invent guitars and make them. Um, and we all have a purpose. I, I feel that uh, strongly. And so, the you know, we experiment in the thriving stages and then find the thing that really we click with. Um, uh, it's called sympathetic resonance. You know, when you For ring sure. a bell, the other bells on the same octave start going off. So we find that thing that really kind of gives us that vibe like that. that connects with us. Yeah. There's where we want to go. Yeah. I think that's important because a lot of people, especially now, people struggle to find what it is that they're trying to do with their lives. Yeah. And they go off and make a ton of money or they try and have a big career and all that. And then they realize that it's just yeah. a bit transient at the end of the day and they're missing something. You see that a lot. I wonder if I wonder if that finding purpose and having the ability to experiment is only afforded to people who are comfortable at that point. It sounds like a it sounds like a wealthy problem at that point. Do you know what I mean? No, I, I think I, I, only if you use the term in terms of a rich generalist. Meaning, I, I don't think it's materialistic base. I think it's a it's a it's a mindset base. But someone would argue, how am I going to find my purpose and and trial? When I'm broke. Well, I volunteer at a homeless shelter here in Laguna Beach, and I sit down with homeless men and women. We talk about exactly that question. And they say, well, I'm going to be happy once I get yeah. an apartment, and my kids will talk to me again. And I don't want to be rich, but I want to pay my bills. And, and, they have, and then it's kind of like, I'm going to be happy once this happens. And I say, and then I go through a chart of, of 12 areas in life. And, you know, there's sociological and intellectual and financial. And financial is only one of the 12. Mm. And I say, now, what's preventing you from being happy in these other 11 areas? You know, what's preventing you from going down to the beach and meditating or, or deep breathing, whatever you want to call it? What's preventing you from running and jogging 
or exercise, which releases incredible endorphins into our heart system that are on par with cocaine. I mean, they're really powerful drugs that are released naturally and in a healthy way by exercise. What's preventing you from going to the library and checking out a book and reading and, and being intellectually um, enlightened, whatever you want to call that? You know, so there's 11 ways. And, and, and it was so exciting to work with these homeless people because it's like, you know what? We can be happy today, even though we're literally dead broke in a homeless shelter. We don't need to postpone our purpose just because of the money. Uh, no, and I've, I've heard yeah. that many times. I wasn't born rich. Mm-hmm. I, I had a job since I'm 14 years old. Um, you know, so so um, I, I don't buy that excuse. Mm-hmm. It's just a kick the can down the line. We can be happy today if we choose to and start choosing activities that don't cost a dime. Here, here, and and they don't call me Wim Hof Warner for nothing. Uh, I I like a few of your 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 deep. I'm joking. I, I, I'm about I, I, to say. I, I know what it is. Talking out of his backside. But, 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 but I, you know, I do, I do, I do agree that breathing is very, very helpful. But but I think that there's something else in in finding your purpose, and that's that um, you can transition. So you can have life is about chapters, right? At, at the end of the day, uh, we know where we start, we know where we end, but we don't really know what happens after that. But we can choose to extend that belief system right so in that situation it's hard to say that we've got one conquest one one purpose it can evolve so if you're homeless and have nothing it's most important that you're centered around a purpose because that belief system is what gets you to thrive if you've got an unclear purpose you cannot even build anything you can't focus you can't measure right you can't communicate at all You're, you're likely to do more destructive things because that that present state is not clear in your mind but it can change for them Right? It can change as, as, as they start to thrive and build. It's okay to say, I, that chapter is closed, it was effective, or I learned a lot, and now I have a new purpose. People will have multiple chapters in their life, I believe. I think um, the, the, the thing about the comparison you made with living on an island is on an island, you don't have culture smacking you around the head say like the societal pressures of you must do this you must do that i like that if i was just nah man if you like i think that's why people when you read about homelessness sometimes people go to homelessness to yeah. because it they just don't care anymore do you know what i mean yeah but yeah. you know anyway but, we keep it moving yeah we're, keep, we're, keep, I, <laughs> we're I actually, getting very philosophical here i i, I, <laughs> I happen to think that, that I, i'm not making the case for being on an island i couldn't think of anything worse but i'm just saying i don't <laughs> think there's anything wrong I think some people, the offender is an example where I would call him a narrow case mm. um, and, and some things go out the window. What I'm saying is if other people are driven by driving a Ferrari and, and climbing the ladder and get their fuel from that and their purpose and hopefully they can hold down a relationship and kid, good for them, power to them. Everyone's, if, if some people want to uh, practice effective altruism and, and try to have the most macro benefit for as little as possible, power to them. I lean that way, but but everyone's different. It's but but if this is about trauma, it's about how you get past it. And I, I did a lot of research on this, which I I was on the Today Show in New York uh, talking about does money buy happiness, and the answer is um, money does buy happiness. But the good news is not expensive. In other words, as as long as we have enough to pay our basic bills. Uh, we can be as happy as a billionaire statistically, but when you when you can't even pay your ba- basic bills, that is traumatic. And I'm not trying to yeah, take that away true. from anyone. Yeah. yeah, but but I will also say, I if somebody really craves a lot of money, I hope they get it, and I hope they get it fast because they'll find out how unsatisfying it is um, just on its Fair own. Point. It's life is much bigger than that. So yeah, you got to pay your basic bills, but money beyond that doesn't buy happiness. Can we touch on the effects of trauma on a physical level? Cause I, I want people to get the full picture of why you must deal with your traumas, even though like, because it can come out in a physical way, right? Do you, have you seen in your case studies where so, uh, the adrenaline that comes out of fight or flight, you, I'm reading here that the response can last for years and thus the chemicals released so do you see a physical impact uh from the trauma as well uh you know people talk about stress being a killer people talk about um like uh you they develop illnesses as a result absolutely i've talked to medical doctors that say you know people are in here for this and that and they come back and back to the office and the hospital 
and what the real issue is, unresolved trauma. It literally eats you alive inside. That is, it, unresolved trauma causes an internal war. Outside, we can fool people with our facade and our clothes and all that. But inside, there's a war going on, and it manifests itself in diseases. When we treat the trauma, uh, I, when I go into the homeless shelter, I, they, they, I say, I could care less about how much you're drinking or smoking pot. I, I don't care. What I want to do is I call it the full glass theory, and that glass is full of mud. We're going to start pulling in fresh new habits of you know exercise and reading and having more in interesting conversations and choosing the healthy food in the kitchen rather than the donuts, you know those kinds of things. And that other stuff will naturally go away. Um, and that's the process I use is just forget the bad stuff. It's there. I get it. Forget trying to even treat it. Let's just start pouring in some simple new habits, and we're gonna have we're gonna create a whole not new life, and it it just works. I'm just mm. telling you, this approach really works. Can we list those habits for people listening, real quick? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure. I divide them into four sections. I wrote a book called Me We Do Be, and me habits are um, what we do to improve our mind, uh, our our me. Meaning, we read. We uh, do the deep breathing like we've talked about. Uh, if you're into spiritual or religious, you're, you know, you, you're honest to whatever your vows systems are. If you're more into a naturalist, you can still uh, appreciate nature, but take care of the me, our mindset, and be aware of our attitudes that we choose. The we are getting along with people and connecting with people that we can lift up and that, that lift up us that don't drink, bring us down in their drama, uh, trauma, trauma yeah. stuff, trauma, you know, drama. that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Treating other people with respect, um, walking away from arguments instead of getting involved in it, that kind of stuff. The do habits are getting the work done, you know, showing up on time for our boss, doing a good job, uh, feeling good about what we've done rather than, you know, fake work and all those kinds of things um, and, and doing some exercise, taking care of our health. And then B is what we were talking about earlier is a sense of purpose. It's a sense of legacy. It's a sense of setting some written goals and putting them on our refrigerator and taking little incremental steps every day towards achieving those goals and uh, and that kind of thing. So that's the that's the basic process of the day-to-day -day habits we can do. So we've dealt with the individual, yeah? But obviously something that a lot of people will be going through at the moment is natural disasters. You know, we mentioned at the top of the show, we've seen wildfires across the globe, which scientists are saying due to climate change. Personal trauma is one thing, yeah? But what if you walk out the house and you see catastrophic devastation in your community? You know, it must be even harder to move on because you have your personal journey and then you're confronted with the after effects every day until that's been dealt with. Is that a whole nother level? Well, yeah. I mean, when I went uh, Hurricane Katrina, I mean, it looked like a war zone. In fact, I was driving through the neighborhoods with a guy that just got back from Afghanistan from the military. And he said this was worse than anything he ever saw over there. And it is devastating. It's shocking. And I don't want to take away from that. And you don't want to prematurely jump ahead to the happy talk in, in the third section. You got to deal with your, your stuff there. And I'm not an, an expert as a first responder. We got to, you know, respect that process of it. But really, my focus is, okay, once we've gone through, you know, the first responder thing and we get you know, some little bit of uh, back on our feet, you know, where we go from there. But yeah, it's a it's a whole spectrum of stuff we got to go through. If I, if I can just paraphrase it, because we've talked about it before, because I, I think this is really interesting. You mentioned this idea that, look, if you have to you know, reset and go step back and you know, go, you know repeat again, this is normal, right? So if you've got lingering stuff that's in your environment, because it doesn't go away straight away. I remember being on a holiday when Hurricane Andrew hit in Miami. That shows my age. That dates me, right? But 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 also, you know, Her you know Hurricane Sandy. I also, re you know, remember, you know, nine eleven because I was there. These were things that they were not going away, not even in a period of months. You were reminded every day. So, do you and, leave the environment? Well, it, it, the where well, I couldn't because I had my family American, but but I obviously did leave the environment. But it didn't change how how I felt. Mm. But but I think the challenge is that you you apply some methodology, right, and, and you get some great tips from your book, and as you go through it. You have to accept that there's relapses that, that and going through that process is probably cyclical and slowly you get to look at those memories. I think you talked about them, uh, which would have evoked a certain emotion that hopefully start start to have a different, you know, a more effective 
uh, you, know, you get to look at them in a more effective lens, right, where they perhaps don't trigger you as much. But you've already said it's re a reset. So when I listen to you and you say, look, something's happening to me inside, or it could be a divorce, you go outside, there's another tragedy, or they're connected. I just see that as a, an elongation of the same thing. That you're, you're, you're probably going to go through a number of cycles in that survival phase. Yeah, not, you're right, Martin. And not only that, um, there's a spec what might work for one person may not work for another. With these widespread disasters where you see tens of thousands of houses blown apart, some people, the right thing for them is to move. Just say, you know what, I surrender. My credit's toast. You know, the, the mortgage still, they the bank wants the mortgage paid on a house that doesn't even exist, you know, and you just throw in your towel and you leave. Some people have a different approach that for them, it's right to rebuild, you know, on that same house, because that's the house where the, you know, you remember your five-year-old daughter's birthday, and there's a sense of connection and, and you know, being sentimental about the property. And that's what works for them. So you got to kind of be in tune with yourself and saying what is right for me rather than just copying what's right for somebody else, really being authentic to who you are, who we are as individuals and going that with that path and finding the right path for you. And the, in, in entrepreneurship, there's, there's we say sentimental, symbiotic, um, uh, and, and symbolic's great and insane. And, and I would argue the first two happen all the time. We put the Freedom Tower up in replacement of the Twin Towers because we weren't going to give up that position in our mind. And we were going to put another beacon mm -hmm. of hope out there. Symbolic. Yeah. Sentiment happens every day. We don't even realize it. We're, we're, you know, the average human is very sentimental. Mm -hmm. If you can't do it with, with some rationale that feels normal, everything else is insane. So the extension of that in entrepreneurship is that we, we tell ourselves little, little, little white lies. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we're dishonest to ourselves. We don't intend to be. We overbelieve in the business because actually measuring the harsh truth is harder. And we know we're, we're taught not to quit because you need to be resilient. Sure. Sometimes you need to close the case. Right? In, in, in entrepreneurship, we call it SSI. So you're trying to avoid the insane. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, sentiment in the way that you feel about your business, your cuss, is great. Uh, symbolic uh, is great for product marketing, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the Freedom Tower was incredibly symbolic to not walk away from that area and not market with something that, that mattered, mm -hmm. which was another beaming tower, you know, that, that was equally as good in a different sense to the Twin Towers, even though we'd wished for the Twin Towers back. What was the insane part of that? Well, no, the insane is, is if this is a spectrum, the S's are on one end and insane's on the other, and, and you will push. You will challenge them. If you're over-sentimental or over-symbolic, uh, so I won't give you the entrepreneurship case examples. They'll get a bit dry, but, but pushing a product out too far uh, has a symbolic uh, effect. If it's over-sentimental, well, entrepreneurs are very, or they convince themselves they are, it's going to lead to disaster. You'll spend more money. You'll spend too long in the trenches. You don't look at the problem at the right level. It becomes insanity. And, and so if you can't be rational about sentiment and symbolism, then you've probably got something that you need to really focus on. And, and that, that, that's yeah. insanity. And, and, and basically, that's a different decision set. And fascinating. It reminds me a little bit of Aristotle and egos, logos, and pathos. Yeah. You know, having the emotion, the logic, and the ethics yeah. in, in, the, in the thing. I love yeah. it. Do you reckon um, with what's happening on the world stage coming out of COVID, we've got the wars that are going on at the moment with in the Middle East and Africa, do you think we're, you know, heading into perhaps the most traumatic time of collectively as ourselves with, within our societies, like a pandemic of trauma, would you say? There, I think there are people that have really studied that could that gave you a better answer than I could. My, my sense is, because my doctorate is actually in sociology and, my sense is that there's always been wars all over the planet, but what we have that's new is this technology where we pick up our phones and we're instantly connected to the traumas of other people all over the world. And that can be really traumatizing for ourselves. And we gotta be aware of that and say, you know what, I'm gonna take a break from this, you know, uh, and, and you know, the whole idea of post-traumatic thriving is to replace the self-medication mm -hmm. with self-care. In other oh, words, yeah. I, I'm not, you know, if someone smokes pot or gets drunk, whatever, that's that's kind of masking the dealing with the trauma that they're going through. That's the way I look at it. And there's not that's not necessarily unhealthy mm -hmm. because I talked to people that said, you know, it's a good thing I got drunk 
off my butt every night because I was going to commit suicide. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm I'm not uh, judgmental about those behaviors. I don't want to sound self righteous, but we want to gradually, you know, move away from that towards self care, where we're doing things that you know maybe light social drinking is a little bit better for us. Uh, maybe going and spending more time with the kids and, and these other things and taking breaks from the media. I mean, I love the news like anyone else, but you know, you got to be aware of, Hey, am I getting my blood pressure up to an unhealthy level? Because if I am, I need to practice some self care and back off. I think what I find interesting about what you're saying though, is that because you've got a phrase about sitting in the fire and, um, you know, I've got a question here about what happens if you're still in the thing that's traumatizing you in the first place. For example, if you live on the Gaza yeah. Strip, you're still in the place. Can you find any happiness during that? But the sense I get is that whilst you're going through that, you can still practice some form of self-care to help balance it somehow. Is that true? Uh, Jax, I'm so glad you asked that because right at the start of the book, before I, it's in the introduction where I say, you know, we're going to talk about trauma recovery here, but we first got to put the brakes on and say, are we still in the trauma? Are we in that abusive relationship, you know, with domestic violence or are we in are we living our trauma right now? Because the first step before you get into my stuff, as eager as I am for people to learn these techniques and, and heal uh, is get to a safe place. Yeah. You know, if you're in the middle of the train wreck, you got to get yourself to a safe place. Then we can start healing. But while we're, that's the question I asked right at the very start. And I say, if you're in a, an abusive, bad, toxic, you know, tra traumatic place, forget the book for a little bit and get to a safe place, then we'll heal. Yeah. I got to ask, yeah, you as an economist as well, this, this, is, this is a big question. If you taught how to manage traumatic experience in school, mm -hmm. How much do you think that would affect the 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 things we have in society to support all of that? Do you know what I mean? The AA groups, the, you know, all the, the stuff that people fall into, industries wouldn't be as powerful. Do you know what I mean? People wouldn't be killing themselves with drink, all that kind of stuff. If they taught traumatic, how to deal with uh, traumatic experiences in school. Well, I just want to say that this curriculum should be taught in school because okay. kids are going to face trauma in their life or they're maybe already feeling it when they go when they go home. It may not be such a great situation there. They may be being abused or their or parents are fighting or whatever. Um, we need to teach this skill set to people so they grow up with it, so they know how to deal with this in a healthy way, you know, and up in prison. In San Quentin prison, I sit there with inmates and, and I, I sit in the fire and I listen to some ugly stories. And the whole process there takes about two years to go from the macho prisoner who pretends that they're innocent and, you know, acting all tough to, to really being humbled and admitting what they did was horrible to their victims, horrible for their families, horrible to their victims' families, and horrible to themselves and taking responsibility but when you listen to the backstories of what they went through through kids, I'm just it's like if I had that childhood, I probably be sure. sitting right next to yeah. you, you know, and your judgment goes out the window, you know, and, and, and being judgmental and just realizing if those inmates as kids were taught how to handle their trauma in a productive way, using the principles that we're talking about, sit in the fire, deep breathing exercises. It sounds so simple. Those are the two primary approaches in San Quentin prison to make that, you know, absolutely miraculous transformation from a hardened criminal to someone who you would love to have as a next door neighbor. There can be that miraculous change of heart. I've seen it with this, with the principles we're talking about, but we need more discussions at, in the schools about this topic. I think we're all aware that, um, categorizing treatment for trauma is going on in many areas, right? Well, you uh, said uh, Jeff Bezos was leading some charge in it, right? Yeah, How so, to deal, yeah, build so resilience, some right? philanthropic, but we yeah. can go beyond that at different stages and say that child abuse, alcoholism, right? Treating trauma has been categorized and there's areas where this, this does happen. But I think where but it- But you gets, have to seek it though. We have to seek yeah. it. But I think when it comes to education systems, whether it be, uh, you know, for infants, pre-K or, or in high school, I think the challenge is at the moment society is split into two things and, and I'll be interested in your reaction around on this, but one is that 
leave it to the scientists and the treatment or the, the prognosis to espouse to kids at, at, at many levels is this is what you're taught to take action. This is, when you, this is when you should put your hand up, right? If you are feeling this, so they don't try to cure you or, or teach you. It's almost been seen as an adult event, right? This idea that if you need psychiatry or you need some form of counseling, your parents will help you get to What happens if your parents Yeah, you have problem, to do yourself. Right? That's what I'm saying. Right? So, but, but today, yeah. and it's the same here in England, I'm convinced of it, is you're taught to raise the alarm bell. And there's a set of steps but they don't go any further. So the question to you, Randall, is do you believe there's something between uh, teaching kids best practices that aren't advanced adult concepts? They are things to look, look for more than just the alarm bell. You know, are you being abused at home? Are you being bullied, right? How do you deal when you've got peer pressure and everyone's taking drugs around you or whatever it is that you're facing at school? Do you, because you, you would say you should, that we should teach it at school, um, but that's the, t I would frame what I just said as a fairly accurate view of what, of what, how most people are uh, approaching trauma, um, at schools, what would you like to see changed? Well, the, uh, I'll use myself as an example of how things went South and things weren't so great. When I was, uh, when I had my open heart surgery, I went into the hospital one last time, they took all the stitches out and the doctor patted me on the back and said, Hey, good job. You're fixed. It's done. It's over. There was, but in terms of what I've been through, so physically I was fixed, yeah. uh, you know, I, completely done. I mean, today I can, I, yesterday I ran five miles and, you know, that's, uh, I can tell you a lot of my colleagues and my friends are not, you know, staying active. So I was physically repaired, but emotionally there was zero. Yeah. There was no discussion of what I had been through emotionally through all kinds of tests and poking and prodding and painful, you know, incisions and on and on and on that led up to that open heart surgery. Had there been some discussion, some simple discussion, anything, mm. I could have healed it from it better because through high school, I always had the mindset that I wasn't as good as the other Man, kids physically. Yeah. The worst day of my life at that point was when I was a senior in high school and the coach came up to me because I didn't try out for basketball and I should have. And the head coach came up to me when I was playing tennis. He says, I, I see what a great athlete you are. I wish you had stayed with basketball. You'd be starting today. Um, and that was a result of the emotional baggage I was carrying from my trauma. So having some discussion with kids it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be, you know, uh, revamp the whole school system, but some discussion about what we're talking about with the deep breathing, finding somebody, having somebody to talk to. Um, those two things alone would have changed my world. And that I feel the same way for all the kids around the world today. I want to quote something from the book where you write. Trauma doesn't have to lead to a lifetime of weakness or hardship. In fact, trauma can lead to greater resilience and higher levels of achievement than we thought possible. How does someone do that? Small, simple steps. Don't make it complicated, you know, and, and on the other hand, don't dismiss it because it is simple. Uh, it may be simple, but it works. Uh, it's been proven out of the best academic institutions in the world. Uh, Oxford, uh, I've read the studies coming out of there. There's a big discussion on this. The problem is, is, is it's a discussion at academia at high levels. We got to bring it down to practical tips. And that's what I've tried to do here, frankly, with the book is practical, simple tips we can do to really kind of take advantage of this new science. Um, so keep it simple, but do it. But how do you take the energy that you create from a trauma and channel that into something remarkable? To do something remarkable, you got to accept or support. At the start of our conversation, I said, you know, don't do it it's not a do-it-yourself project. Accept help from other people. People are, I agree with what was said earlier. I forget whether it was you, Martin, or you, Jax, that people are generally, at, at, most people are good people that want to help. When they see somebody knocked down, they want to be there yeah, to help mm -hmm. them out. I've yeah. seen that. And it's really inspirational to go into these disaster sites and see how many people and how good humanity is. People want to help and, and help their uh, fellow humans. Accept that help. Don't be proud. Don't put on a show that you're just fine. Uh, admit that, hey, I'm kind of knocked down. Can you help me out and accept that help? That's a big part of that, uh, that answer. 
I just want to talk about how you help because that's one thing I see is people often don't know what to say. And you put a lot of emphasis on talking. Say someone can't afford a therapist, you know, and they yeah. need to talk to a friend. How should the friend respond? Do you know what I mean? That in a productive way, because they're not psychologists. Like you've got someone telling you all this stuff. Right. Like what do you do in that situation as yeah. the friend? Yeah, brilliant. Because the answer is you don't need to give any answers. Simply talking about it relieves that pressure. There's no magical answers. I mean, I tried to bargain my way out of getting heart surgery, but simply having had had someone to talk to that understood that simply says, I, you know, I, I, I am so sorry. Yeah. It's as, as simple as that. Yeah. Instead of slapping on a bunch of Band-Aids and, oh, it could be worse and all these little anecdotes. I make a whole list of them in the appendix of the book of the things not to say that are damaging. Uh, but just listening and, and saying what's true. And that's simply, I'm sorry. I wish there was something I could do. Period. Yeah, it's enough. simple, but a lot of people don't know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And is there a possible takeaway for someone who hasn't been through a trauma that is affecting their life. You know that you know you quoted sixty six percent of people have experienced a trauma uh, by the time yeah. they've reached college and hundred percent. But say like someone's like, do you know what? Nothing's crazy has happened to me, or perhaps they don't see it like that, and they have all this energy, maybe a bit of drive and passion, but they're yet to channel it into something great. How would they go about doing that? Well, you know, I we all know people that have kind of enchanted lives, or at least it seems that way, that are just have great DNA and are happy, and and things have kind of fallen into place for them. And and for them, I'd say that's that's wonderful. You know, share. You know, but but you can still share with other humans, help other humans. You know, people that are less fortunate. I think that brings even greater joy. That's the great uh, secret of service: is that when you help someone else out you get more out of it than what you've given away. And that applies to somebody who even has an enchanted mm -hmm. life. Yeah. There's one more point that I, I need you to leave people with, which is about the having gratitude towards your trauma. Because we talk about it a lot. And sometimes we, we feel that the conversation about gratitude is a bit like snake oil. Like you want me to be thankful for everything. Well, yeah. you give us your definition of gratitude within trauma. Since I shared I was a bad example of, of how to not handle my trauma, uh, I can share that I am never grateful that I had open heart, open heart surgery. It was a horrific thing for a kid to go through. But today, as a 62-year-old guy, you know, a tall, white, straight guy from Orange County, I have way more empathy for, pe for people that are uh, in different situations. When I see a kid in a wheelchair, um, I may not look like it now, because uh, I physically healed from it, but I, I'll admit it. I get a tear in my eye and I'm grateful for that tear because I have an empathy that I otherwise would not have had. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not grateful that I went through that train wreck in the first, you know, 10 years or 11 years of my life, but I am grateful that today I have this increased empathy. And when I see that kid in a wheelchair or particularly kids really uh, resonate with me, I, and I want to help. I want to do something to help. And I'm grateful for that tear in my eye. That's what I'm talking about with gratitude is, is to be grateful for the lessons and the great, great, grateful for the maturity that it brought into our lives that we can, we have a richer, more full view of the mm -hmm. world rather than this isolated, sugar-coated approach. Well, I think it's what's given you also the amplitude to do the work you're doing now and for us to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Had I not had this tra uh, trauma, we, I wouldn't be talking with Martin and Jackson having this this wonderful conversation. I, I enjoy every second of this conversation. And so that's another thing to be grateful for. And there's so much to be grateful for, the, the richness and the lessons we learn from it, even though what we went through was really ugly and embarrassing and harmful and hurtful. There are always lessons of gratitude to take away. Nice. I think that's a wicked way to end the conversation. I, I do. And I, 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 I've got something a little more, I think it's important, but a little more lighthearted, I guess. And that's if you ever make it to the Hamptons, look me up and I'll make you feel better about your golf game. <laughs> <laughs> you help I'm, you uh, I'm, thrive I'm really, in golf. I'm grateful for resiliency because Lord, do I need it. I tell you. <laughs>
<laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thank we, you, Doctor. Really Bell. enjoyed it. Me too. Everyone, go and get a copy of Post Traumatic Thriving if you're looking to add that to your reading list. Uh, if you're isolating on your 10 day isolation, it's one to pick up on Amazon. Let's go. Or wherever you get your books. Jeff, we ain't plugging you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Martin. I've enjoyed uh, talking to you guys. You guys are awesome. Appreciate it.